We had a great physical meal. Previous to that, a good spiritual meal this morning. And now it's time for spiritual dessert. <laughs> we uh, always enjoy being together here, and we appreciate Pastor Ben and and the team here at Pioneer allowing us to come together and enjoying a quiet day together whenever we can. And uh, it's nice being in a place where where everybody uh, is searching to get ready and trying to get ready and asking God to get us ready for a second coming. It's when, when our focus is on the same thing. Did you know that unity is very important to God? Amen. In fact, it works both ways. When they were building the Tower of Babel, one of the things that worried God the most was unity. He said, there's nothing they cannot do. Let's go confuse their languages. When there's unity, even the devil's work goes forward. And did you know the demons usually fight each other all the time, but they're united on one thing, fighting God. And the enemy is always fighting each other, but they're united on getting ready to, to fight God in his second coming. Uh, if God's people don't have unity, how in the world is God going to finish his work? We have to realize the importance of unity. I had a couple of questions just before uh, I, we started the meeting this evening, this afternoon. Uh, the questions are, were about the changes that I referred to in 2015 uh, in our basic fundamental beliefs. Uh, in 1980, uh, I just finished college here at Southern, and I rented a plane and we flew out to Dallas to the first general conference session that I had ever attended. <clears throat> we took six persons and we flew out and landed at Keene and uh, we stayed at Keene and then we went out to the Dallas, uh, we went out to the Dallas uh, stadium where the general conference was. I met for the first time, it was the first time that our Russian brethren had ever been allowed out of Russia. Wow. So I met I met some of our Russian brethren that were so excited to be at a general conference since the communist years. And I learned my first Russian words, which I never forgot. So even today I use some of them. And, uh, uh, and, and during the general conference, I also got a chance to meet the GC president, Pastor Neil Wilson. I'd never met a GC president before. And I was just a young college graduate and I was, I was anxious to to work for the church. So it was my first exposure. After that, I remember going to, to the next general conference, which I think was in New Orleans. And then I kept, I never missed a single general conference all the way to St. Louis in 2015. I've been a delegate to several. I've been translators at several, translating into Spanish. Uh, uh, up in the wind, up in the top little where the commentators are, the sports commentators usually are. I'm sitting there listening to English and talking to Sp and talking in Spanish, and and uh, you have to be rather fluent to do a good job uh, because you you have to be able to only listen to the English and your mouth has to talk the other language without thinking. Because if you have to think, translate, and speak again, you've already missed what they're talking saying. So you have to be hardwired in two languages, which when you grew up speaking two languages, you were. In Brazil, I met some people and they said, we recognize your voice. And I said, I don't know from where. Oh, I know where it was, at the general conference. Uh, we were listening to your translation. I said, but you speak Portuguese. And they said, yeah, but we all listened to the Spanish translation. We didn't listen to the Portuguese. I said, why? Because they were just commenting. They were not translating. They were saying, they're talking about women's ordination. They're talking about that. They're talking about that. They were just commenting because they couldn't translate fast enough, so they were just saying, they're talking about this subject and they're talking about that subject. So when we realized we could go over to the Spanish channel and you were translating live every word they were saying, then, and we could understand Spanish somewhat, uh, then, then it, made it, uh, it made it easier for us to understand exactly what was happening. That's how they can remember Well... No, the original is English, but they don't understand English. 
The delegates only understand Portuguese or Spanish or Russian or whatever. So, yeah. No, most, most foreign delegates don't speak English. So they need, they need to listen to it in their own language. So uh, in 2015, uh, I always had a booth. We always had a booth, one, maybe two. Sometimes we had three booths, one for aviation, one for, one for media, and sometimes one for other, uh, uh, other ministries. So, we could, so people could come and we could talk to everybody. But in 2015, uh, the Lord impressed me not to go to my booth, just to go and sit inside and listen to what was happening in the business section, session. Because I like to meet people. But you have so many people that you sometimes don't get a chance to go to the sessions. So this time I sat inside and I just listened. And... Uh, then I realized why. Because they were discussing changes to the fundamental beliefs, which is a very serious issue. And, um, and there was a proposal made to make a lot of changes, some in the church manual, some in the fundamental beliefs, some in other areas. And so that subject came up, and they were discussing it. And so, several pastors, uh, well-known, and others not so well-known, were opposed to making any changes to the fundamental beliefs. So they, so they expressed that at the microphone. So the, 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 the vice president that was presiding that particular session was very fair. Uh, he said, well, would you like to make a motion to withdraw those changes? I mean, I'm used to, I'm used to things happening sleight of hand. And it happens a lot where they try to get around the majority of the decision, like what happened in the women's ordination. The World Church voted four times no to women's ordination. And what did the North American division and the, and the Euro-Africa division and Australasian division, I just call it the South Pacific division, Australia, what did they do? They said, we could care less what the World Church said. We're going to do what we want to. So, if anybody calls anybody a dissident, I would call the, the, the leaders of the North American Division and the Euro-Africa Division at that time. It's, it's, not, it's called Inter-European Division now. And I would, the Australian, the South Pacific Division, I would call them dissidents because they should have obeyed what the World Church voted. They didn't care in the slightest. They said, we're going to ordain women as ministers anyway. So, and so I would say the dissidents are the leaders who are employed to obey what the church says. But they disobeyed. It's not whether you agree or disagree. It's what the, the world church voted. That's what is the official position. And so, and so they, I was there listening. And the, the, the vice president was very fair. He said, uh, would you like to make a motion? And one of the pastors made him, I move, Mr. Chairman, that we withdraw these two changes from the proposed list of changes. Good. Okay, do we have a second? We do have a second. Okay, all those in favor of withdrawing those two changes, raise your card. Those that are in favor of keeping the proposed changes, 80% raise their card, said let's keep the changes, and the changes were made. So, so it was a fair vote, and 80%, approximately 80%, Apostatized. what? Apostatized. Basically. <laughs> About 80% of the world delegates voted to keep those changes and then voted in favor of the changes when the list came up. So these changes were made in broad daylight with plenty of discussion and in a fair way. So we can say that it was not sleight of hand and we can say it was the will of the world church to make these changes. I'm going to tell you what they are right now. So, so, so it's, not, it's not like some things have been voted... Uh, in a very sketchy manner, in a way that they, had, uh, they tried to do them real early in the morning before the South Americans and the Africans got up. <laughs> and I've seen several votes like that. So they, they told the North America, they tabled them, they tabled the changes, and they said, we'll deal with it tomorrow. And then they told all everybody, come early in the morning before the Africans and the South Americans had time to get here. They get here late every time. And they voted it knowing full well that a big chunk of the vote would, would not be there. That's sleight of hand. Right? That did not happen here. This, this was broad daylight, 
and it was the will of the world church. Here are the changes. I'm just going to read the part that was the, the last little piece there. This is talking about this is talking about uh, the second coming, the way it was before 2015. It says the almost complete fulfillment of most most lines of prophecy, together with the present condition of the world, indicates that Christ's coming is imminent. That's what it used to say. The way it reads now, it says, the almost complete fulfillment of most lines of prophecy, together with the present conditions of the world, indicate that Christ's coming is near. They only took the word imminent out and replaced it with near. Now, at that time, the argument was, why should we change it? Because they said it means the same thing. But, but that's linear reasoning. I mean, that's circular reasoning. It, if it's the same thing, then leave it alone, right? It's not the same thing. That's why they changed it. Uh, a few months later, at fall council, I sent a friend of mine uh, over to talk to the GC president, and I said, ask him what they mean by near, and if he still believes in the imminent coming. The, the GC president said, Nothing has changed. We still believe the same thing. We just changed a different word. He said, well, do you believe in the imminent coming? Absolutely. And, and when do you think Jesus could come? Well, it might be sooner, but it could be more than 100 years, said the GC president. Well, that means that it's not imminent. If you really believe it could be more than 100 years, you have no idea that we're living in the last generation. Right? Isn't that what it means? So, but I, I believe him. That they're, they're, they have not changed what they believe. They have always believed that Jesus' coming could be quite a ways off. When Pastor Jan Paulson was president, he, he, spread, uh, he spread the idea that Jesus' coming could be more than a thousand years off. Paulson, Paulson was a Jesuit. Yeah. Well, at least he studied under some. Uh, but he was, he, that's what his specialty was, ecumenism. So... Um, I'm careful when I, when I say somebody's a Jesuit because to be a Jesuit, you have to actually have studied, Je- studied to be a Jesuit priest. Uh, mainly, we don't have Jesuits in, in the church. Mainly, what we have is people who are under the influence of the Jesuits, right? A lot of influence. Like one vice president that came here to, uh, to our office in uh, McDonald and talked to my wife and I, he said the Jesuits were their counselors and friends. Well, that's what I mean by being under the influence. If the Jesuits are your counselors and friends, he said, they're not our enemies. They are counselors and friends. Okay, so, no, but that's what they are. They are counselors and friends to them. So so if you're a friend of the Jesuits and you're under their counsel, then there's something wrong. Because we know that they're the worst enemy, declared enemy of Protestantism. So so if if you admire counsel and have friends that are then you're, the, we have there the same problem. We, we're under their influence. Okay? So, so that's the one thing that was changed from imminent to soon. But it does reflect what I believe they believe, that Jesus' coming is not near. It could be a long ways away yet. The second change that was, that was made that was in basic fundamental beliefs, uh, it used to say, as the Lord's messenger, talking about Ellen White, her writings are a continuous and authoritative, authoritative source of truth which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. A continuing source of truth uh, is something that comes from the Lord. Uh, so you, can, you don't get truth coming from a person. It comes from the Lord. It's a source of truth. That means you can quote it. It's authoritative. You can quote it as you do scripture. That's what it used to say. What it says now her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. Uh, by taking out a source of truth, what you're taking out is, of course, the, the inspiration that comes from God. Because many writings, many writings provide comfort, guidance, and instruction. Uh, and when you write with prophetic authority, it doesn't mean that all her writings are prophetic. Only 5%, approximately, of what Ellen G. White wrote is prophetic. Is Councils on Diets and Food prophetic? No. no, it wasn't intended to be prophetic. It's, to, it's intended to provide guidance on health. But is it inspired? Yes. But 
In this case, I can say it's not prophetic, so we can ignore 95% of the writings. So those two changes, though very subtle, uh, give a basis of why there's so much attack on the spirit of prophecy today, why some pastors are saying it should, the spirit of prophecy should never be quoted from the pulpit because it's not inspired anymore and it's not necessarily guidance. Well, uh, it's, uh, the, all throughout history, the prophets have been killed, stoned, ignored, but they, but they, but they paint their tombs nice and white. It's always been the case, Jesus said, right? You, you, you whitewash the tombs of the prophets, but you always killed and stoned the prophets. Um, my father noticed that two weeks, about two, approximately two weeks after the general conference session, when they voted to do that, for the first time, the White Estate released a statement which said, which, quote, which Sister White wrote before she died, I am convinced she said, that God's remnant people will reject the testimonies. And it was only after they took that vote that the White Estate released that statement, basically confirming that the Adventist Church has rejected the testimonies. Now, does that speak for every one of us? No. It doesn't speak for me. I do not accept that vote at all regarding what I believe and what many of you believe. It does not reflect that. The position on divorce and remarriage does not reflect what I believe. There's many things that have been voted that do not reflect what individuals believe in the church. But it is the official position of the church. And, and I, I support the pastors that want to support that position. If they want to keep their job, that's what they have to do. They have to preach the official position of the church. How do you expect to want to keep your job in and not preach the official position of the church. Right? So in that position, in that respect, I agree with them that they should preach whatever the, ter- the church voted. The question is, I do not agree with them that they should keep their job. Why would you teach error in order to keep your job? If you want to keep your job, by all means, preach the official position. But if God's going to hold you accountable someday... It's another God, the human God. You're going to go to God and God's going to say, but I said, yeah, but the church said, but I said, well, I wanted to keep my job. Similar to what, what I found in, uh, in Holland, when I used to work in the Venezuelan Union, uh, I'm going to begin in a minute and we're going to begin with prayer. I'm just kind of clarifying a few things uh, just before we begin. <clears throat> uh, in Holland, I had one of our uh, pastors from the Caribbean because when I worked in the Venezuelan and Tilly's Union, uh, Tilly's Union, uh, the three, you know that you, have you heard of the ABC Islands? The ABC Islands are Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao. Three Dutch islands. They're called the ABC Islands. Okay? They speak Dutch there. They belong to Holland. And so, even though they speak Spanish and Dutch and English, they used to study in our union. They used to come to our university. So when I went to Holland, one of the young pastors that graduated from our university in Venezuela was pastoring a church in Holland. And he invited me to speak at his church. So I went to speak at his church. And then he said, I have a question for you. He said, here in Holland, we're not allowed... We're not allowed to speak against adultery. We're not allowed to speak against uh, fornication and living together. We're not allowed to speak against homosexuality. He said, so what am I supposed to do? I said, what do you mean? Well, we have young people that live together and we cannot discipline or disfellowship them. And we have couples committing adultery and we're not allowed to do anything. Or homosexuals. I said, but you know what the Bible says? Yeah, but I would lose my job. Ah, I see the problem. Very good. This is my advice. Keep your job and go to hell. (laughs) Pastor, you don't mean that. Of course I do. You either teach what God said or you go to hell. I'm sorry. I do it. It's very stark truth, but that's the truth. If you speak for God, you teach what God tells you. If you lose your job, that's God's problem. 
that you are clear with God. If you're going to keep your job and you're going to teach error or fail to teach truth because you want to keep your job, that's fine. But just know you're going to hell. <laughs> well, no, but I never went back. Uh, but but it, wasn't, it wasn't his. That was his private advice I gave him in his office. I didn't say that from the pulpit. He was just asking me in his office what he should do. But that's the dilemma that pastors have today. Will you support the erroneous position, the official position of the church? Or will you keep your job? Or will you teach Bible truth and risk losing your job? But those are the only choices you have. They t we tell people all the time, keep the Sabbath, but I might lose my job. But you have to obey God. The consequences are, oh, how can you stand in the pulpit and tell somebody that and you yourself will not do it? So the pastor should be the very first one to risk his job in order to obey truth. Amen. Don't go around telling anybody to keep the Sabbath unless you're willing to risk your job for truth as well. So that, that's what we're faced with today. These are the choices we have. You obey God or man. You obey God, you can keep things calm for a while. You obey man. I'm sorry, if you obey man, you obey God and you might face a crisis. You might lose your job, but... That's what the whole world is facing. Obedience or consequences. That, that's what we have. What are the consequences of disobeying God? Pretty severe too, aren't they? Okay? Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we are opening your word. We realize we're in a world crisis. We realize that we're facing difficult times, last day decisions, that there is a there is a, a crisis that is facing individuals as well as the, the world. We realize, Lord, that we might lose our job if we obey you. But that's what's coming. The decision is coming. We might lose our life. That's the decisions we have today to make. And if we can't make the little decisions, how are we going to make the big ones? The shaking has happened. It's happening. And we have to decide what side we're on. So please help us to understand the issues and to make right decisions today. Please impress our minds with your will for us. In Jesus' name, amen. How imminent is the imminent coming of Jesus? The dictionary says, imminent is impending, it's at hand, it's close, it's near, approaching, fast approaching. It's coming, forthcoming, on the way, about to happen, upon us, in store, in the offing, in the pipeline, on the horizon, in the air, in the wind, brewing, looming, looming large, threatening, menacing, expecting, expected, anticipated. That's a lot, a lot of synonyms, isn't it? Uh, those are a lot of words that one could choose from, not just a soon coming, we could say looming, brewing. Jesus' coming is in the air. It's in a pipeline. It's in the offing. It's about to happen. All those reflect something at the door. In fact, they didn't even use that, at the door. They should have put that in here too. Uh, when somebody's at the door, you can, you can expect a knock within a second or two, right? Something's going to happen. So the word imminent it has a sense of urgency, has a sense of nearness. Soon doesn't. When is grandma coming to see us? Oh, don't worry, honey. It'll be soon. Does that mean it's today? No, grandma might come to see us next month or in three or four months. When we say Jesus is coming as soon, the president said correctly. It could be in a hundred years or more. It, it, that's, that's what the word soon. Because in soon is comparison to what? Soon is comparison to the last 6,000 years. So if it happens in a hundred years, compared to 6,000, that's pretty close. But imminent has a different meaning. Imminent means I expect it to happen any day in my lifetime. And that's different. Now, uh, uh, when my grandparents were alive, they expected that Jesus was going to come in their lifetime. And I could say, probably my dad would say the same thing. And then, and then um, and my parents, my father's here with us, he expects to see it in his lifetime. We don't, none of us know. I mean, we don't know if today's our last day. 
I was in Barbados, in the island of Barbados, uh, some years ago. The sister in Sabbath school got up, gave everybody the welcome, and fell over dead. She had a heart attack on the spot. She didn't know that was her last Sabbath. She didn't know that she wouldn't even finish the Sabbath school, the church service. She died during the welcome in Sabbath school. None of us know how much we have. But assuming a normal lifetime, assuming that we could, we could live a normal lifetime, be it uh, three score and ten, or be it four score, four score and ten, whatever it is, we can expect in our lifetime, in this generation, Jesus to come. Now, you could say, but our grandparents, what is the difference? Our grandparents expected the same thing. Yeah, that's a fair question. What, what's, what's the difference between the grandparents and us? And I would, I would agree that prophecy and other timelines, we're going to talk about several timelines, I mean several uh, test witnesses that are showing us, would say that nothing has happened in the fulfillment of prophecy that is, as has happened in the last, last few years. I mean, we've always known that the churches would gather together, that they would cast away doctrine, they would, be, they would work together, uh, that national, nationalism that we see today in the United States, uh, the willingness to give Rome control of the White House, Rome control of the Congress, to let them control the finances, the way that Rome is involved, a Catholic president that goes for instructions. Even John F. Kennedy didn't do that. John F. Kennedy was our first Catholic president, but he wasn't running to Rome all the time, which is one reason they, they took care of him. He, he had a different direction than they wanted. But now we have a chief justice Catholic. We have many Catholics. In fact, there's no Protestants in the Supreme Court that I know of. There's Jews and Catholics in the Supreme Court. Um, there could have been some changes I'm not aware of, but I believe that was the last, the last I, I heard. Um, so what about, what about uh, this, the moral situation in the earth? The confusion in, in families? The confusion in, are you a male or female or what are you? An animal? What are you? And, and you know, in, when I grew up, Anybody who's, who thought they were different than what they were, they would put them in an insane asylum. Today, they legislate insanity. I mean, how, how can a 50-year-old man say he's a 5-year-old girl? Come on, that that's definitely needs to go to Moccasin Bend. <laughs> yeah, they now legalize insanity. And, and uh, in the world, all around the world, you have protection for insanity. And in fact, talking against it can be something, can be a crime now. So the devil has legislated an insane situation in the world where not, you can't even think normally. Uh, what, what was that? Uh, I forget the term right now. It's in a world, in the world where... Uh, uh, Lies are so common, truth is considered to be, I forget, I forget how that, how, how, tr truth is revolutionary. Where lies are common, where lies are so frequent, that if you tell the truth, it's revolutionary. They're not expected to tell the truth. Do you believe most politicians when they talk? Do you believe all the news you hear? Propaganda. Yeah. Yeah, it, you, you can't believe things anymore. Uh, when I was hijacked in Mexico, when I was hijacked in Mexico, the, our neighbor here in Appleton went running to my dad and, and my dad first heard that some American drug tracker, traffic, trafficker was, was uh, captured in Mexico with, by the name of David Gates. Well, that, that's, what the, that's what the news put on the air because that's what they heard. I've never even seen drugs in my life. And, and yet, because they hijacked me and accused me, autom automatically they reported as news here. Well, I began to distrust news from that time forward. I don't believe half of what I hear and the other half I doubt. So, um, so what does it mean? What does it mean to be an Adventist? 
A real Adventist? Do real Adventists believe in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ? Yes. I believe so. If you believe it's a long way off, why would you use the word Adventist? The difference between Seventh-day Adventists and Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists believe in the imminent coming of Christ. The Adventists are just members of the world. Maybe. That's, that's one way of, of defining. Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists are on this world with a mission. Amen. We're supposed to have a mission. First of all, if you use the name Adventist, you are here because you believe in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ and you're here to prepare the world for Jesus' coming. Amen. Seventh day is a very important part of the name and it reflects the fact that we believe that God's law is still valid and, it, and nothing has changed and that it reflects his character and it is to be upheld and his law is to be obeyed. Amen. Seventh day Adventist, very important name. Um, can you be a real Seventh-day Adventist if you don't believe in the imminent coming? I do not believe so. I think you have to believe in the imminent coming. If you don't, you're just a club member. You're not a real Seventh-day Adventist. What is the mission of the church? I looked up the mission of the church, the official mission on the official website of the General Conference here a minute ago. I'm glad it still includes the preaching of the three angels' messages. It still says that. But... That's impossible to do if you're going to be friendly with Rome. How in the world can you be sending delegates to Rome and acting friendly with Rome while at the same time you're going to be preaching the mark of the beast? How can that be possible? It can't. It's going to be changed one of these days. They're going to take that mission down and stop referring to three angels' messages but you can't be going two opposite ways. It is true that the three angels' messages is part of our mission is to prepare the world for Jesus' second coming. And, and therefore, we are to preach the three angels' messages, but we can't be going to Rome at the same time. Why do you think... In Bolivia, we try to buy great controversies. You can't buy them. They're not for sale. Maybe they can find one copy for you. No, I want to buy a box full and give them away. No, they're not available and they're not going to be available. So here in the United States, we have all kinds of great controversies printed by all kinds of, of um, private ministries. This is, here's an interesting situation you may not have thought about. Who wrote the great controversy? Ellen White did. Under inspiration, of course. But who gives the people who print that book the right to, use, to print the name Ellen G. White on the book? The General Conference would not give it to you. They, they have the name Ellen White trademarked, so nobody can use it. But then why do we keep using it and why, nobody, why don't any, doesn't anybody say anything? Because it's not the General Conference that gives the right. It's the other churches like the Free Seventh Adventist Church and, and others that would give you the right because they are grandfathered in from 1917, they, they have the right to give you. And so even though you don't belong to the Free Seventh Avenue Church, it's the Free Seventh Avenue Church that gives you the right to use the name Ellen G. White because the GC will not give it to you. So many rights that we have, unbeknownst to us, come from other Seventh Avenue churches that do not belong to the General Conference. Because the General Conference copyrighted the name Ellen White so nobody could use it. How can you copyright a name like Ellen White? I, I don't think anybody copyrighted the name David Gates. But can you copyright a name? Is that, is that possible? I mean, I guess Kellogg cereal. What? Anything is possible. Anything is possible. Um, so um, the, the, there's another, other words that were copyrighted. The word Adventist. The word ministry. I thought, can you copy the word ministry? Can you copy a word? Can you copyright breakfast? Mi the ministry of health? What would the ministry of health say if you sued the government for using the word ministry? And, I mean, you can't, you can't copy our generic words, but or re register, make them into registered trademarks. So we, we print, and we don't think anything of printing great controversies, putting LNG White and distributing them everywhere, but if it, if, only the Seventh-day Adventist Church had its way. You could not use the name Ellen White. But, thank the Lord, we still can use it and we still have freedom. 
uh, a little news note, just so you know. Uh, the, um, the Free Seventh-day Adventist Church, similar to our black conferences, was started to protect the black people. It, in, in 19 and early 1900s, remember, they were only about 50 years outside of slavery, right? There was still a lot of prejudice from, regarding ex-slaves. And black young people who wanted to study theology didn't really have an opportunity to get jobs. And they weren't offered jobs in white churches. And after Ellen White died, it got worse. So the Free Seventh-day Adventist Church was registered in California as a corporation. Uh, the Berean Seventh-day Adventist Church with, with uh, the, the use of the name Free Seventh-day Adventist Church. It, it was trademarked the year after Ellen G. White died for the purpose of helping young black young people to get jobs, to work for the church, and to have a place where they could develop in ministry. And so it lasted many years until finally the Seventh-day Adventist Church realized that we need to make a place for black people too. So they developed the black conferences, which we have regional conferences, especially in here in the South, right? You all are aware about regional conferences or not too much? Yeah, yeah you all are aware with it. Yeah. Of course, today, of of course, today, a black conference, like a white conference, you might say, can have Korean churches, Spanish churches, black churches, white churches, everything, right? Uh, we, need, we just have a, a the, on the same territory, we have two conferences, that's all. Well, the white conferences wouldn't take the Spanish or the black conferences. Well, there, there are some black, uh, Spanish now. Not many. Not many, but, but, but they started releasing. Uh, re, black conferences re, have most of them. And uh, um, so what we have is, we have a, a situation where the church, the, the Free Seventh-day Adventist Church, for near, over 100 years, had, had uh, they just existed. They weren't growing very fast. But, but they still existed corporately. God protected it. And finally, recently, the Free Seventh-day Adventist Church has been growing massively around the world because people are realizing it, realizing that They've held on to the doctrines. They still believe what we've always believed. And they have freedom. They're not being controlled. They can have freedom. As long as they believe the truth and teach the truth, you can, you congregate, entire congregations are joining. I, would, I, I don't know the number, but I would say hundreds and hundreds a year of congregations are joining the Free Seventh Adventist Church. Uh, and uh, uh, so... So what happened is, what happened is that General Conference decided last year, the year before last, to sue the Free Church and take away the use of their name. But they've existed for 107 years. So they're, they're grandfathered in. Um, but, but still, a lot of money, deep pockets, and uh, a lot more lawyers. You can get your way sometimes. So they, they sued the, the Free Seventh Adventist Church, and uh, the Free Seventh Adventist Church didn't know what to do. So they, they prayed and they said, well, let's hire the best legal organization we can find because if we lose that, everybody loses. Mm-hmm. It's not just Free Seventh Adventists that lose, non Free Seventh Adventists that are using the name Adventist or printing books under Ellen White will also lose. So they hired the best legal organization they could, it cost them half a million dollars. That's a lot of money for legal defense. But they, they have thousands of lawyers and they're specialists in, in those kind of areas. When the General Conference discovered, discovered that they had hired that organization, they became scared. They got scared. And they said, when well, that organization has the capability of of defending them very well. So the first thing, the motion that they did was to, to make it impossible for them to use that organization and, and, and filed for a motion that that legal organization could not defend them, which I never heard of such a thing. You can get anybody you want to to defend you. They lost. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because many of us enjoy certain freedoms that come from outside the church that we don't even know we have. So we have to realize that we owe a lot to our 
other seventh Adventist brother. So, um, so the next thing that they did was during the the last hearing, the judge discovered, but because they filed all these things, that there's a there are a lot of organizations that use the word Adventist, not just Free Seventh Adventist, not just Reform Seventh Adventist, not just Seventh Adventist. There's other organizations. Uh, including Seventh Gay Adventists, and and so uh, so they filed this motion, and the judge accused the church of having gotten the registered trademark for the name using fraud. And when they sensed the direction was blowing the opposite direction, they quickly attempted to settle out of court, and they settled out of court. And they settled out of court and the general conference backed away and said, we will never bother you again Amen. with the use of the name. Amen. You have the permanent right worldwide. They have the permanent right to use a name. And if the GC ever does give them a problem, they, they will probably lose the, the, the trademark to the name Adventist. So they've decided they're not going to do that. This is very good news. It means that there will be a people at the end of time, at least one, that will stand for the truth, though the heavens fall, that has the name Seventh Day Adventist. Amen. We pray that a lot of, of us will stand for the truth, though the heavens fall. We may not be free Seventh Day Adventists. We may be Seventh Day Adventists or Reformed Seventh Day Adventists or another type of Seventh Day Adventist. But, but we want to be faithful to the name. We're Seventh Day we believe in God's law and we're Adventists and we believe in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ. And that's our faith. And that's our faith. That's our mission. Okay. God's remnant people are best described by Revelation 14, 12 and 19, 10. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. There is going to be a people at the end of time that keep the commandments of God. And it says in 19.10, I fell at the feet of, of him, uh, fell at his feet to worship him. He's, and he said, the angel, see thou do it not. I am of thy fellow servants and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what we have is the last day people will be commandment keepers and will have the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Officially, the Seventh-day Adventist church has rejected the inspiration as a source of truth of the spirit of prophecy. I can't speak for the organization. I am an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. I'm retired. But I can speak for me. I can speak to the fact that I still believe and that I do not accept that decision that those delegates made, even though it is a legal position and for them it does count. I, I do not accept that position um, I, I believe that what the Bible teaches has the last word. And, and that, that's, what, that's what counts. Uh, the ex-union president of the Dutch Union, uh, Reinder Bruinsma, has written quite a few articles. He's quite verbal uh, uh, about what his position and his, we talked about last day theology, remember, earlier today? We talked about last uh, generation theology. He wrote a big article that says, saying no to last generation theology. And he's written other articles saying, Rome is never going to persecute God's people. They're now a new organization. They are God's people, and they do, they do not persecute anymore. And they will not persecute. So... Uh, they're reformed now, but but of course of course when it, it, uh, we need to, you said on December twenty three of next of this year, 24th. the twenty fourth, uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on that. And before it happens, before December twenty fourth, we're going to be broadcasting out of out of GMI and out of Bolivia and other places, hopefully from here too. We're going, to try, we're going to identify every single church that goes to those meetings. Amen. Those are the daughters of Babylon. If you go to those meetings and you say to the Catholic Church, I'm sorry we left. 
We want to be your daughter again. You are a daughter of Babylon. I'm sorry. Be it, be it Pentecostal, Reformed Dutch Church, be it other churches, other Protestant churches, be it Adventist Church. And we're going to do it before it happens because we're not going to just criticize what the church does. But we're going to let the whole world know there's several implications to showing up at those meetings. Showing up at those meetings means you are asking forgiveness for having left and you're justifying the mother church for having killed those 30 million and tortured and burned 30 million martyrs, Christian brethren. Because you're saying you were right, we were wrong. So if anybody goes there and tries to do that, they are responsible for the blood of the martyrs too. So we're going to identify those churches. I pray the Seventh Avenue Church won't go, but knowing the history, they're going to be there. But we don't make the choice whether they go or not, but we will identify those who go. And the Catholic Church will make sure they identify them too, let me tell you, because they're very proud of those who are coming. So it'll be public information. But if the Seventh Avenue Church and the Director of Religious Liberty from the, North Amer- from the, from the General Conference shows up at that, he is representing officially the church with the approval of the General Conference president and everybody else. Our president preaches nice sermons, but as long as he allows this thing to continue, he's responsible for not speaking up. Eli was a good man. Eli never did anything bad, except he would not discipline evil. And God refused to offer forgiveness for his sin. So we have some good people working at high levels, but if they refuse to stand up for what's right and let sin, they are responsible. So we have to be clear. We support good leaders. We support those who preach the truth, but you've got to stand up for the right. Amen. If you do not say anything, if you do not say anything when evil uh, is carried forth, you are responsible for and, be, and guilty of the crime too. And if you are a president and you don't say anything, I'm sorry, the buck stops at the president's desk. So anytime you see somebody show up at Rome, the president's responsible. Because he has the voice. of the, He can stand up and speak against it if he wanted to. So I've known him a long time and, and he, has to, he has to speak up or be held accountable. I like his sermons. They're always very nice. But it's not the sermons that make the difference. It's what happens behind the scenes. Hmm? So if you change, it, uh, when it was time to talk about the injection, he was very verbal about, let's not talk about it. But when it came time to change the basic fundamental beliefs, he never showed up. And when there's Jesuits, counselors, walking around everywhere, nothing happens. So that's okay. Uh, everybody has freedom to do what they want to, but you're responsible for your decisions. So I, I believe in his heart he probably wants what's right, but when you get elected to a position, you are responsible for the leadership. The captain of a ship gets to decide where the rudder's turned. And if you turn the rudder toward Rome, the captain is responsible. You can say, but the pilot did it. The pilot did it with the permission of the captain. Hmm? So that's where we are now. So, uh, Reinder Bruinsma blames the last generation theology on Jones and Wagner, on Prescott and Andreasen. He says, simply, sinless perfection is out of human reach on this earth. It will never happen. That's exactly what Satan says. It's impossible to keep God's law. Nobody can keep God's law. Even Satan couldn't. It's not my fault. Nobody can keep your law. Huh? Well, Jesus did. Yeah, but he was half God. So God says, you know what? Just to prove you wrong, I'm going to show you there's 144,000 people that keep God's law perfectly and get sealed before the second coming. Amen. That will shut Satan's mouth. <laughs> Satan says, nobody can do it. Well, God says, I'm going to show you not just an Enoch, not just an Elijah, I'm going to show you 144,000, be it symbolic or literal, it's a lot of people compared to two in the past. Would you agree? 
That would definitely say, I rest my case. Now, what allows God, when Jesus comes, what allows God to chain Satan to this earth for a thousand years? The 144,000. Because there's no arguments anymore. His last arguments have been settled. But the 144,000 play that role. So Satan says, it's impossible. And so does, so does Mr. Bruinsma. You know, I, uh, when we had the meeting here at GMI, uh, when we were asked to close all our ministries around the world for five to ten years, and, and uh, not just the media, not just the television, not, not just the orphanage, not just the medical work, the schools, everything. I had to calm my wife down because she, she takes care of patients. She sees the, the wife's she sees the mothers. She sees the children that are sick. She sees the husbands that die, the mothers that die, and the airplane that comes in and saves a life and brings a parent home again and brings a child home again. And she stood up and, and, and she almost lost it. I had to tell her, shh, 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 sit down, sit down, honey. But I did something that I'd never done before. I said, excuse me just a minute, gentlemen. I have to talk to Satan a minute. They looked at me like big eyes. You're going to talk to Satan? Yes, I just need to ask him a question. But don't worry. Uh, excuse me, Satan. What do you want God's people to do? Do you want them to expand the work and reach out all over the world? Or do you want them to close all the orphanages and schools and, and medical programs and close everything? Satan says close everything. What are you telling me to do? Isn't that what Satan wants? Let's, all we have to do is say, what would Satan want? And say, and what are you saying? We can't be saying the same thing Satan is saying. <laughs> Satan says it's impossible to keep God's law. God's law. And Mr. Bruins is saying it's impossible to keep God's law. Nobody on this earth can do it. We know a person can do it. We know that. How is it possible to keep God's law? Only Christ living in us. That's the only way we can do it. And, and we need to stand up for God and his law and say, Lord, live in me. Take control of me. Do what you have to in me. I don't know how I can do it, but you can do it. With, that, with God, all things are possible. So you have to do it in me. Now, you say, David, this, these are some difficult issues. There's a lot of conflict in the church on this. I'm sorry. That's what the Bible says. Be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Amen. If I'm going to aim for being like my heavenly father, I have to aim and live like Jesus lived. Jesus gave his life, he, Jesus lived his life totally under the control of his father. Amen. And how did he do that? By daily surrender, moment by moment. What are we supposed to do? The exact same thing. And if we surrender to God, did you know that perfect surrender is perfect victory? Amen. The problem we don't have perfect victory is because we don't surrender. <laughs> Uh, God, I know you want that, but I want this. Well, it's okay, but let's try tomorrow. Now, moment by moment surrender means we have perfect victory. Now, I look at myself and I go, oh, just like the lady in Holland that came to me and said, I gave my life to the Lord when I was a little girl. I've never taken it out of his hands. I've lived, now I'm 75. I've never taken my life out of Jesus' hands as far as my choices. I've wanted to choose God. But I'm not perfect. I don't think I can do it. And I said, you're right. Let God do what he does. He's the only one that can do it. He that began a good work in you will, will be faithful to complete it. That's the only hope we have. If God is going to do a perfect work in us, he better do something. But he will not do it against my will. So I choose to ask him to do that for me, which I can't do for myself. Lord, I'm not there. Did you raise your hand? No, I was just going to say that seven churches, every single time it says, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh. My wife, for those of you that can't hear, my wife said, in the seven churches of Revelation, uh, it says, to him that overcometh, Amen. to him that overcometh. The seven churches. 
there is a there is rich rewards promised, but it's not to him that overcometh by himself. It's to him that overcometh by choosing to allow God to carry his perfect will out in us. And that's what we need to choose. Each of the martyrs made a choice, didn't they? And there's that there's that song, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Do you know that song? I pledge allegiance to the Lamb with all my strength, with all I am. Have you, have you heard that song? Yes. We were, we were uh, listening in Spanish on the radio station in Bolivia the other day, and I said, I want that song for my sermon. But, but the words didn't rhyme right, so I, I'm going to translate it from scratch again. So I translated it, and my granddaughter sang it in English and Spanish. But it says, in, in the past... Everybody had to make a choice. They, they stood before tyrants and were given the choice of life if they would deny the Son of God. And one by one, they chose to die. Isn't that why we have to make a choice? One by one, each of us have to choose to die to our right for a job, to, a, to the right to buy and sell, to the right to have all the freedoms that we want. We have to choose one by one. I can't choose for you, you can't choose for me. But we have to make the choice. I would rather die than be disloyal to the Lamb. And so that's, that's where we are with, with our beliefs and our loyalty to truth. Uh, we had an English teacher from the university in Brazil come to visit us. And he was taking some classes toward his master's degree and it required some theology classes. So he took a few theology classes and they were telling him it's impossible to, to be perfectly obedient to God in this lifetime. But he said, but that's not what the Bible teaches. No, but that's the official position of the church. No, but that's not what the spirit of prophecy teaches. I know, but that's the position of the church and we're going to teach the position of the church. Well, that sounds Catholic to me. In other words, the position of the church is more important than what God's word says. That is Catholic. It's not, it's not sounds Catholic. It is. Whatever the church decides, that's the truth. Not what God said. So he said, I'm a little, what do we do? I said, you have to make a choice. It's an individual choice. Loyalty to God or loyalty to man. It's the same position that all the martyrs faced. Are you going to obey the church or obey God? One by one, you have to choose to die. To self and die to your rights. Is it easy to do? It's not easy to do. A people at the end of time achieve moral perfection through total surrender to God. This is only possible through total surrender. It's not possible through any other way. We are, we are, uh, we are required by God to demonstrate obedience and loyalty to Him. The the cost of not doing that is eternal death. I don't think we want that. We're right at the edge of eternity. The clouds are about to open and very soon we will see the Son of Man descending with our reward. We don't want to miss it. Consider, the, consider what are the two things that they offer you. A few more months to be able to buy and sell versus eternity. Everything is versus eternity. Now, even if we have to suffer, now I'm talking from here, none of us have the courage to suffer for God right now because the courage is not given to us until we need it. But young maidens died. Old men died. They had courage. When I was in Rome, I spoke in Rome and I, that evening I went to the Circus Maximus, which is the big circle where they used to do races right in front of Nero's house where they used to burn the Christians to keep the fires alive at night so that they could see the horse races. Imagine how many people I, I went out to the middle of, of that racetrack and I knelt down and I said Lord this is where all my brethren died. Would you give me the courage to do the same thing that they did? Don't please don't let me Betray. I want to be along with them when they come. When Jesus comes, I want to be with them. 
I want to be courageous. I need the courage because I don't have it now. They asked me if I wanted to go into the Vatican. I said, I'm not going to step foot in there. Let the whole world wonder, but I'm not going to wonder in there. <laughs> you know, uh, and I, I was I, recently, just a few weeks ago, I was preaching with, uh, what's the, ah, his name slipped my mind in, Calif- in Columbia. Christopher Hudson. You, you know Christopher Hudson, the, the, the forerunner. We were both down there. We have different points of view on different things, and we had a great fun. We've preached around the world in different parts, but we, we always have fun together. But, but I would present one view on the pulpit, and he would present the opposite. And I would say, well, you all heard my partner. He preached different. Do you want me to preach this? One? Yes, yes, yes. So we had different points of view on different things. But, but we have a lot of fun together, and, uh, and, and we, we, we spoke to him. But he, I remember one time he told me he went to the Vatican, and before he went in, he, he, he had his drone. And it went in, went all around the Vatican, took pictures. And he, came, and he came out again. And then another time, the Pope was there, and he got his drone and went around. And they froze his drone and took it away. And when we were in Peru together, the Pope came to Peru. So we took the drone. There was a helicopter going, do, 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 do. And I guess they jammed the frequencies. And so he tried to get his drone up and he wanted to go take a picture of the Pope mobile as it was going by. But his drone wouldn't work. As soon as the Pope went by, the drone started working again. Because I guess the helicopter is beaming, beaming a, a jamming frequency around all those frequencies so that nobody can do drones, you see. Anyway, uh, so we went to the cathedrals and we looked at a lot of things. But he went to the Vatican and and he was looking for his drone. He went inside looking for his drone. And they said, who are you? So he, he gave him his driver's license and he came back a minute later and they said, we know who you are. Get out of here. And, and he left. He never saw his drone again. Uh, but I'm not going to go in there. Why should I go in there and put myself on... Uh, I, I'm not so anxious to see the Vatican that I have to step on the... Uh, on, on the devil's headquarters. Uh, and they know who I am too. Uh, but there's something interesting. My friend from Angola told me that when he was working for the devil, when he was raised by the demons, he told me that he could close his eyes and open them and he'd be any, anywhere in the world. Sometimes he chose to travel by plane, but that was 15 hours away sometimes. Sometimes he'd go click, click, and he would be there already. And he would go anywhere in the world, just in, in one blink of an eye. And he said, I've been to the Vatican several times. And he said, I, most people don't know. But in the Vatican, he said, the devil has his throne. The Pope is just, just uh, a, a puppet, a figurehead. He said, he has his own throne room. Only one human is allowed generally to go in there and take orders. And, and the, he comes out and distributes the orders. All the demons are in there all the time and Satan sits on that throne. It's a separate room set aside just for Satan. And, and the Pope just does what he's told. But, but he told me, I've been here several times. And uh, we have, in, in late June, we have a camp meeting coming up. Battles of Faith. Battles of Faith for young people. And he's going to be, looks like one of our, today he wrote to me and he said, I'm, I'm free during those dates. So he's willing to come. I, don't, I haven't looked for the ticket yet. I've got to see how much? But, but um, you might be interested in battles of faith uh, for the youth coming up in late June and the first week in July. But he's going to be one of the speakers if I can, if I can work out the ticket for him. But uh, we spoke together in, in the Philippines recently. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite a story that he has. And it, it's uh, quite impressive how the devil has set up his kingdom to call the shots and do everything. Well, guess what? God has a kingdom too. And he has, he has his servants that are willing to obey everything he says. Follow the Lamb everywhere he goes. And that's what I want to be. And I invite you also that we follow the Lamb everywhere he goes. Uh, very soon, it's going to get worse. Uh, by the way, March, I wasn't here in March, 
But the plans that the devil has for the world, if it weren't for God's mercy, we would already be, we would already be, in, uh, the world, we would have no freedoms anymore. The fact that we are still here is a miracle. In March, there, there, were, there were plans to bring down the, the whole entire grid in the United States. March 7. It was going to start in Washington State, go to California, spread across the West, hit the Midwest, hit the East, and go all the way. In one single day, all the grids in the United States were going down. I don't know. All the electrical grids. And, and all the banks were going to close. And while people were in the, at home, just they, everybody was going to be told, just stay at home. We'll fix it. And while everybody was calmly staying at home, no telephone, no internet, no communication, no electricity, no banking, no stores, no nothing. For about three days. And during those three or four days, the government was going to go pick up all the people that are on their watch list. No communication, no phones, nobody knows anything. Just disappear. Boom, 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 boom. Everybody. And they were going to open up the banks with the new electronic currency. The Great Reset. That was supposed to happen March 7. It didn't. God's mercy. You see, Satan makes plans, but God decides if he can do them or not. And uh, Amos 3 7 says. Did they say what I'm saying? No, they don't. God did, but they don't say. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Did you know that that's, that's a rule of the game? Satan can't do anything without announcing it either. And everything, God makes the rules. Satan doesn't make rules. God makes the rules. But God plays by those rules. So before God acts, he announces it. Before Satan acts, he has to announce it. And then he has to ask permission. If God says, no, not yet. Did you know they were going to destroy Atlanta about 10 years ago? See, there are a lot of things we don't know. They announced that they were going to bomb Atlanta and destroy the center of Atlanta about 10 years ago. Well, they had a bunch of coffins that are east of Atlanta for all the... Half a million uh, coffin liners. Yeah. I went in immediately and found it on, I immediately found it on, on Google Earth. Three days later, they disappeared off Google Earth. You can't see them anymore, but it were, they were there. And, and uh, the, the, the Illuminati, the, the, high level, the high level Masons and others announced that they were destroying Atlanta. And a pastor called me from Atlanta, uh, a lady whose, whose boyfriend had been a high level Mason, before she joined the church, called me all in that one week and said, next week they're going to destroy Atlanta. I said, not if God says no. And God said no. But Satan has to announce his plans. Maybe he uses the Simpsons. Maybe he uses rock music. Maybe he uses country music. Maybe he uses other means. But he announces it in his normal way of doing things. Maybe it's a movie. Did you know they wrote a book about 10 years before the Titanic sank? I think it's called Titania, the book. I read it, and it's the same size, same identical scenario. Everything happened identical to the Titanic 10 years before in the novel. And then it got carried out, and you go, what? Well, he has to follow the rules. He can't do anything without announcing it, but that doesn't mean because he announces it, he can do it. March 7, the grid is coming down. The great reset is to begin. And it didn't happen. That's why we are living in borrowed time. We are living in a time when, when God is holding the winds. The angels are holding the winds, but they're not going to hold them forever. They're releasing the wind. And, and Hilda, she's always on top of things, and she sends out, I don't know, if that's all you do all day long, I don't know, but you send out reports <laughs> all day long. Anyway, the reports keep coming across and some of them are very interesting. But, but as, we, 
as we check out the different things, we realize Satan would love to destroy this earth before Jesus comes back. Imagine if Jesus comes back and there's not a single human alive. Who's he going to come for? Is there going to be a bride alive? Is there going to be a people alive that follow the Lamb everywhere he goes if nobody's alive? You see, Satan's ideal would be to destroy the earth with nuclear warfare and when Jesus comes back, there's nobody. The main thing is the bride. If there's no bride that follows the Lamb everywhere he goes, Jesus can resurrect anybody he wants to, but the proof is not there. In order to be able to enchain Satan, the bride has to be the closing evidence. There has to be a people which follow the Lamb and that are sealed. And then God says, there you go, Satan. You made an accusation. I prove you wrong. I rest my case. And that's it. All Satan can do is get angry. And then, when Jesus comes, they enchain Satan for a thousand years. Otherwise, Satan's going to continue to complain. He goes, you never proved me wrong. So we have to, we're part of that scenario. Let's be grateful to God for every day we have. If we have resources, let's use them to carry out God's will. If we have influence, let's use our influence to carry out God's will. If we have talents and skills and whatever we have, let's dedicate it to working for God. If you ever wanted to work for God and you have an opportunity, do it. If you get an invitation to work overseas, go. Be a missionary. If it's at home, do it. Giving out books, call porter work. Just work for God. The greatest days of the church are right before us. But we have to, we have to make the decision to give ourselves totally to God. Unfortunately, unfortunately and sadly, a painful process, even most painful for Jesus himself, is that the church is going after Rome. Oh, yeah. And uh, well, which, which ship are we on now? What do you mean, which ship? The ship with the one eating the timbers or the ship? Oh, oh, the, oh <laughs> from the vision of Sister White. Yeah, yeah we, have to, we have to take a position and not everybody is going to join the same position. That's the sad part. Does God love his church? Of course he loves it. Is the Seventh Day Adventist Church the most blessed church in history? Yes. We've been blessed with more truth than any other church in generation alive. But just like Israel, we following after other gods. That must be really hard for the husband. Huh? How would you like to be a husband when your wife is chasing after another man? You're just about ready to get married. Jesus is not married yet, you know. Huh? The wedding hasn't taken place yet. But the bride-to-be is chasing after another man. In love with the world. I mentioned that I think one time. Did I, did I tell you the story about Miss Church member and Mr. World? Never told you? <laughs> Google it. Mr. World and Miss Church member. Mr. World and Miss Church member. It's a book written in the 1800s. I, I had the book. I think I sold it to McKee Library in Southern. I had my whole library. I sold it to them. I had a good collection of 1800 books. I love collect. You know, there's nothing about a book, 1800s, you go like this. You can smell it 100 years ago. <laughs> I love old books. And they have the old covers, and it's just like, I guess it's like old violins. Our sister here plays the violin, and she used to play they let her play a Stradivarius. You know what a Stradivarius costs? Three million dollars for a real Stradivarius. And she's a violinist, and she, she told us today she played one. Imagine holding a three million dollar Stradivarius in your hand. Uh, I can imagine flying a three, five million dollar jet. <laughs> a piece of equipment that's worth the cost. Anyway, so uh, Miss, uh, this Mr. World and Miss Church member Mr. World's a very handsome, well-to-do gentleman, and he invites Miss Church member to a little party and to this and that. And Miss Church member goes, "But I don't, I don't uh, mix with the world. You know, I mean, we're separate. We belong to God. It's only a party. You can still come back and you can still go to church." I guess one party one hurt. Little by little, Miss Church member goes to more and more, and she eventually goes down the path with Mr. World quite a long ways. Until in the future they look up there and they say, what's all that smoke? And they hear screams. 
and you're coming to a river. That river is full of fire. Whereas the old path that she was on before goes way up the mountain. It's rugged and narrow, and all her friends are on that path. But it's too late. Miss Church member followed the world to the very end. Anyway, it's an old book. If you, I think it's on the Internet. You can Google it, and if you want to read it, it'll be a blessing to you. Let's not be like Miss Church member. Let's not follow Mr. World. Let's follow the Lamb. And, let, and he'll take us. He gave his life for us. He gave us everything he had, and he has a place prepared for us. And let's follow him, and he'll take us home one of these days very soon. Okay? Would you like to kneel with me as we close? Our loving Heavenly Father, we belong to your people. We belong to your church. We belong to the remnant. We have been blessed with great truth. We are sorry we apologize, corporate apology, for having drifted away from truth and having a relationship with the great whore. This is adultery, spiritual adultery, and we are guilty of that adultery as your remnant people. We have rejected light. We have rejected truth. We have rejected the spirit of prophecy, and we're in love with the world. Please forgive us. Those of us individuals that refuse to go in that direction, protect us, help us to stand for truth, though the heavens fall. And like our brethren who gave their lives, May we also pledge allegiance to the Lamb, and one by one, may we choose to die to self and live for Christ. Give us a perfect character. Teach us whatever way you want to teach us. And someday seal us with that seal of heaven that guarantees that sin will no longer have power over us. Not even once. We long for that. It will happen in our lifetime. We look forward to that, and we give our lives to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.